It's the difference. Come on. Okay, so we all know that wicking is one of, if not the most, frustrating parts of candle making. I think that's a given. We've all experienced the troubles of wicking. However, unfortunately, it's also one of the most important. Go figure, right? Well, what's one of the best ways to understand how to solve a problem? It's to learn the basics, learn the fundamentals, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about really what exactly is a wick, how does a wick work. We're going to talk about the different types of wicks that are out there. We're also going to focus on some of the specific popular candle wicks, really ones that are very common with the suppliers that we all use. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's get into it. What's up, everyone? My name is Wade Thomas. I'm the owner of Black Tie Barn Candle Company. This channel is really dedicated to trying to add some value into the candle making community. Uh, not so much about me or what I do or how I've got here, um, although I've had some requests on videos like that, so I may add some down the road. But if you want to learn a little bit more about me and my company, I'll leave some information down in the details in the description. So feel free to take a look. But anyways, today's topic is really about helping candle makers understand wicks and wicking in general. Now we're not going to talk about the details of wick testing and really how to find that optimal wick. This video is really about the different wick types that exist what makes them different from one another, and how you can use that information to make you a better candle maker. How you can use that information to help you decide which candle wicks to test for your applications. So what exactly really is a wick? Well, wicks are basically just braided or knitted materials, typically made of cotton, and they hold the flame on one end while using the other end to kind of supply fuel up to the flame. This is done through a capillary action to sustain the flame. If without the capillary action, without the fuel of the flame, the flame would die out. I think most of us understand in a nutshell what a wick is, but how exactly do wicks work? Well, to oversimplify it, I sort of kind of just talked about it. it. It functions like a fuel pump in a way, or really maybe a better way to explain it is like a straw. So it's essentially sucking fuel, which is the wax in this case, the liquid wax. So as the flame melts the wax, that turns it into a liquid, which is easier for the straw to then suck up that liquid and then fuel the flame. So if that is it in a nutshell, then why is it so complicated, right? Well, while the function of a wick is very straightforward, is there's a lot of variables that go into a wick and what can cause some wicks to work while others don't. For example, one of the reasons a wicking is complicated is to supply the right amount of fuel to the flame. If too much fuel is sent to the flame, it can almost cause like an overflow reaction. And this is what we see with mushrooming or a carbon buildup on carbon head on top of the wicks. That is when it's too much fuel is sent to the flame more than it can consume, but not enough food up the straw or fuel to the flame and that flame can eventually starve and drown out. However, the real issues that most candle makers have when working with a wick is really boils down to two things. It's the type of wick being used and the size of the wick, both very critical parts of wicking a candle correctly. There are hundreds of types of candle wicks out there and each one of those have anywhere from 10 to 20 plus different sizes within that specific type of candle wick. So as you can see, if you just do a little bit of math. There are 100 different wick types out there, and let's just say for simplicity that each wick type has 10 different sizes. Most have more than that. You're talking about a thousand different wicks possible to be used in each application. So you can see why it can get complicated pretty quickly, right? And those wick types and wick sizes really have to be taken into consideration when you're talking about the application that it's intended for. Wicks need to be used for a specific purpose. For example, let's say you're working with a really viscous wax, which is a wax that is high in viscosity. This can be some of your more harder to burn applications, some of your parasoys or soy in general is a more viscous type of wax. What if the, uh, the fragrance oil that you're using is a more viscous or heavy fragrance oil? And then again, you throw in additives like candle dye or UV inhibitor or Vivar, all of those things add to the complexity of that wax and the viscosity of that wax. And the harder, thicker that that combination is, it can might possibly clog the wick, might not get enough fuel to the flame. What if you've got a wax that's ultra thin? Maybe there is, it's not viscous at all. What if, what, you know, what if it has a low melt point and there's not much to it and you're not using additives or you're using a light fragrance oil, right? Then that's a different type of fuel getting sent to the flame. In that case, you might need an entirely different type of wick or for sure a different size of wick. You know, in the first example, a wick gets clogged and it can't get fuel to the flame, then the flame's just gonna eventually die out. It also might clog and cause some ugly mushrooming because it can't combust all the fuel. It could tunnel. There are several things that can happen. On the flip side, in the second example, if you got that thin wax and you're sending way too much fuel too quickly, that can also cause mushrooming. It can cause wild, hot flames that get out of control. It can combust way too much fuel. It can get very dangerous, right? I think we've all seen bad examples of candle maker, candles that have possibly caught fire or 
just wild, uncontrollable flames. The wick was too large. Um, the flame was too big. Uh, but at the very least, it's going to consume the candle much faster than you intended for. So you're, either way, you're getting an unhappy customer. Reminds me of something I wanted to mention. So very commonly on Facebook groups um, or help forums related to candle making, I, along with many other candle makers that have been kind of doing it for a while, always kind of have this go-to response whenever someone says, especially some of the newer candle makers, ask a question like, I'm using a three-inch jar, what wick should I use? And the responses we always give, and that I'm, I, I always give as well, is it depends, or depends on the wax, and depends on the fragrance oil. Now, sometimes I'll go in more detail. I'll say it depends on the wax type, it depends on the fragrance oil you're using, and the amount of fragrance oil you're using. Sometimes I'll even say it depends on any additives you're using. But in a nutshell, what I'm basically saying is it depends. And the reason I say that, and the reason so many others say that, is not, not to try to be vague, to not come across like we're not trying to be helpful, it's just we're trying to reinforce the concept that it is so important to understand that wicks depend on all the other variables. You might remember from you know younger days or, or back in school, we learned a lot about you know the scientific method. And you, you had your you had your dependent variable, your constants, and your variables. Well, your constant was the one thing that remained the same. The dependent variable was the thing that you were trying to change, the thing you were trying to affect, the end result. And then your uh, independent variables. In other words, your, the changes you're making are what cause, combined with the constant, is what causes that end result. So it's the same with candle making. Let's say, for example, the, the result we're looking for is a properly burning candle or a properly burning wick. The constant in this case would be usually your wax, because most people will use one or maybe a couple different main waxes. Um, but let's, let's say in this example that the constant in this example is the wax. Well, the variable would be the fragrance you're using the amount of fragrance you're using, the jar that you're using, or maybe your jar is constant and you're deciding and you're flirting with some different waxes to use. Well, then your waxes become the variable along with your fragrance and the amount of fragrance and any additives you use. And so the reason I mentioned the scientific method is to illustrate the fact that the variable regardless changes candle to candle. At the very least, every time you change fragrances, you're changing a variable, which means you need to retest and use possibly use a different wick. It could be just a different size of wick. It could end up being the same wick, or it could be a totally different type of wick. You change the formula, the recipe of that candle. You've changed a variable in that formula. And when that happens, everything kind of has to be retested. So I'm going to explain this maybe in a different way too, that uh, I think might, might be helpful. Imagine you're eating a milkshake. Right, and let's say it's one of those really chunky type of milkshakes, like a blizzard, and it's got the chunks of you know cookie in it, or maybe it's got strawberry and other fruits in it. But either way, it's a milkshake that's really heavy and thick, and it's got those it's those great thick milkshakes with chunks of whatever you decide to add. Have you ever tried drinking one of those out of one of those tiny little white straws with a little yellow band, of the, like the like the little tiny straws you get from McDonald's, right? Have you ever tried to drink one of those thick chunky milkshakes? or malts or blizzards with one of those straws? How difficult is it? You could suck to your face turns blue and you're not getting anything out of that straw. That straw is not meant for that application. That straw is not meant to eat that milkshake. The chunks of fruit or cookie are never gonna make it up that straw. Even without the chunks, the milkshake is so thick that it gets so frustrating trying to drink it, right? I mean, your milkshakes might bring all the boys to the yard, but if they can't eat it, they're gonna go home. So what about those waxes that are thinner or not as viscous? Um, for example, a lot of the straight paraffins are very easy to burn, or you might have a real low melt point wax. Either way, let's imagine one of those waxes that isn't as much of a tough application or tough to burn application. For this example, let's imagine a glass of water instead of a milkshake. Water's a lot thinner, it's a lot, it flows a lot easier than a milkshake, right? Well, that's the same, same situation with waxes. Some waxes flow easier than others. So again, for this example, for using water, Let's, let's assume that you're gonna use the straw that the straw that you should have used for the milkshake. You know, that the big red straw that's real thick and got a wide diameter, it's got that you know, convenient little spoon thing on the end. That straw is great for milkshakes. But imagine sticking that into a glass of water and sucking up the water. You're gonna suck up so much water, you'd choke or the water would go everywhere. I mean, you'd make a mess. But at the very least, it's inefficient. I mean, you're being wasteful. You're gonna consume that glass of water much faster using a giant straw than you would if you just used one of the appropriate size. That was a fun analogy. I might have to use that more often, but uh, hopefully that analogy made sense. The point is, is you need the right tool for the job. You need the right wick for the right application. And that can depend on container candles, pillar candles, 
taper candles, tea lights, votives. It's not just about the candle type. It's about the jar that you're using, the diameter of the jar. Are you using one wick, two wicks, three wicks? Are you using additives like dyes or UV inhibitors? How much oil are you using? What type of oil are you using? I've got a hundred plus different candle variations of my own in container candles, and some of them use the same wick, some of them use the same wick size, but some of them vary just because of the fragrance oil. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the primary types of wicks. Now, as I mentioned, there are over a hundred specific kinds of wicks that we're gonna talk about a little bit later, but as far as among those specific types, they all kind of fall into a few different categories of wicks, and that is your square braid wicks, your flat braid wicks, and your cord wicks. So let's talk real briefly about the differences between those wick categories. First with your square braided wicks. Now these aren't as common in the container candles as they once were. Your square braid wicks are either braided or knitted generally, and they, they can offer a slight curl to them, but they're really more square and round in shape, and they kind of offer a more full flame because of that. They're better for your more viscous waxes that we talked about, and your harder to burn applications, higher melt points, or again, just more viscous type waxes. Their popularity has really been replaced by more of the flat braid type of wicks. And again, in the specific wicks, when we talk about them later, you'll see a number of them fall into this category. But essentially a flat braid wick, again, can be braided or knitted, but it's also, it's done in a, a more of a flat, thin way. So, and you'll notice this if you just examine your wick type, some of them have more of a round shape to them. Well, your flat braid wicks are gonna be more flat. That allows them to curl a little easier and curl a little more consistently. They were originally designed for taper and pillar candles. Um, however, they have become more common in container candles, mostly for the reason, and, and this is kind of a ambiguous term, and sometimes it can be misleading, but you'll hear the term thrown around, thrown around of self-trimming. Now, what self-trimming really means is it doesn't mean you're never gonna need to trim the wick. It doesn't mean that it literally extinguishes itself perfectly as it goes. I mean, that, that does happen, that can happen when you wick correctly, but what self-trimming really means is that it curls. And the purpose for the curling is as it curls back into the flame, the tip curls back into the flame and, and extinguishes itself as it burns. Ideally, that is what happens and that is why they're referred to as self-trimming wicks. And because that term is so appealing, everyone flocked to flat braid wicks because they curl more than the others. However, take that with a grain of salt. Self-trimming, again, does not necessarily mean that it's going to self-trim. You can get a, can a wick that continues to curl uncontrollably. You can get some that curl, but just never really extinguish. They eventually turn into a mushroom themselves. So uh, again, just kind of take that into consideration when you're using the term self-trimming. But again, that is why those flat braid wicks have become so popular. Now, while they've become more popular, and they, and they are very good wicks overall, they do not have quite as robust of a flame as your square braid wicks. Some of them still burn very hot, but because they don't have as much of a robust flame or because they're not rounded, they can get clogged a little bit easier and they can struggle with capillary action a little bit more than your square braid wicks. Again, it's nothing usually drastic, but if you ever have some of those more viscous, harder to burn type waxes and you're struggling with your flat braid wicks, you may try one of your square braid wicks to see if that helps. And then the last main kind of wick category is your cord wicks. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, again, they are typically made of cotton and they're braided or knitted around the outside, but the difference is that they have a, a core. Most common three types of cord wicks would be your cotton core, which again, it just has an inner cotton filament as the core itself. It does offer some rigidity and some structure to your wick. I guess I should have said first, the, the main benefit of a cord wick is that it stays more rigid and straight up in your candle, not only when you're pouring, but also during the burn process. Um, however, they can be more prone to mushrooms occasionally. Again, it's all about proper wick sizing and proper application. Um, anyways, the next type of cord wick is your paper cord wick. Now, paper cord wick is identical to the, to the cotton cord wick. However, the, the core is made of uh, paper threads instead of a cotton thread. And the last and very popular type of cord wick, and actually it was the most commonly used wick in the world for a number of years, and it still might be, is your zinc core wick. Um, don't let that confuse you. It's not lead, it's not dangerous. It is made of zinc. And again, it is your uh, cotton outer braid, and then it has a zinc core. Now, the best thing about zinc cord wicks is their consistency and their structure. They are so rigid, they never lean. They keep a perfectly centered burn profile or burn pool. That is why they're still a favorite among many seasoned candle makers. Oh, 
There's one other wick type, obviously, and many of you are probably like, wait, he forgot. It's the wooden wicks, right? So we're not gonna talk a lot about wooden wicks in today's video, and the reason is, is because they're so distinct from cotton wicks, the ones that we're really gonna be talking about in today's video, I don't want to add to any confusion or complexity. Uh, we really need a whole other video dedicated to the wooden wicks and the several types of wooden wicks there are and when and why you would use each one in your different wax applications. So uh, we're going to omit wooden wicks from detailed conversation or detailed discussion in this video. If a video on wood wicks is something you would be interested in, go ahead and leave it in the comments and I'll try to work that into uh, the schedule down the road. But uh, just, just wanted to clear everything up that today's video is really going to be about your traditional cotton style wicks. Okay, so next we're gonna discuss the three most common and well-known wick manufacturing companies. And the reason I'm gonna focus on these three is because they make the, the wicks that are most common to candle makers today. And, I, and the, for me, the purpose of this video is to add value and to, and to really help out the, can, the average candle maker. And then we need to focus on the wicks that are most commonly used and the, or the ones that are most available for us. We're gonna start with Atkins and Pierce. This is probably the most well-known of the three manufacturers that we're gonna talk about today, or at least in the United States. To begin with, Atkins and Pierce produce most of the cotton, or most of the cord wicks that you are probably accustomed to using. That would be your, cor your cotton cord wicks, your paper cord wicks, and your zinc cord wicks. Now, most manufacturers produce some type of cord wick, but the ones from Atkins and Pierce are probably the ones you're most accustomed to using. Cotton core wicks are most suitable for your um, viscous waxes, tough to burn applications. They have the most robust and aggressive type of flame. Um, and again, they're more rigid than your standard uh, flat braid wicks, but not as rigid as the other two. The next core wick that we touched on earlier was the paper core wick. Not quite as aggressive as the cotton wick, but still a pretty robust flame and still can be used in many different wax applications. And then last was the zinc core wick. Well, that will struggle in your more viscous waxes. It's really not meant for soy. And really, it's not even meant for parasoy blend if the percentage of soy is significant. Really, where you're going to find the most success with your zinc core wicks is going to be in your paraffins, your parasoys where you're heavy on paraffin, or very low melt point soy blend wax. For example, your Pro Blend 600, your Joy Wax, those are, those are probably the max of the limits that I would use on a soy blend wax where zinc works well. There is uh, 6006 zinc works very well. It is really best for paraffin and parasoys with more paraffin. The next wick type from Atkins and Pierce is a very popular, very common, most one of the most universal wicks out there, which is HTP wicks, which stands for high tension paper wicks. Now it is a flat braid wick made of fibers and other natural materials, but it also has some high tension paper threads worn in to give it a little bit of structure. So if it didn't have it, it would be a flippy floppy little, you know, very, very tough to manage wick. HTP still are fairly flimsy. Some wick suppliers will put a really high melt point paraffin wax, um, coat it with that, so it does give it some more structure, which really does help. Um, I would advise any time you're buying wicks to make sure they do have a wax coating already added to them. Most of your main suppliers will have that. Um, but again, your HTP wicks are flat braid wick um, with some paper threads more added to it. By the way, all the wicks um, when you purchase can come in little sample packs. You can get a sample pack of various kinds of wicks and various sizes to really help during your testing period. But when you do come to order, they typically will come in uh, a packs of 100 size like these. Um, and then as you grow and grow, you can get packs of 1,000. Some do 500, um, but, it, but it really varies. Um, but again, they usually will, you'll wanna buy several different sizes of every wick. If you're not doing a few sample packs, by the time you start ordering in bulk, you still need to get several sizes because, because of those variables we mentioned earlier, you might need several different sizes. Now, one of the main benefits of an HTP wick, it has a really consistent curl, and it also works good in most wax types. You can use it in paraffin, uh, soy, parasoys, coconut, you can um, really any kind of blends. It's one of the most universal wicks out there, and that's why it's so common. A lot of people will just start with HTP, order a bunch of sizes, and make it work. Um, again, so if you're ever struggling with uh, wicking when you're when you haven't tried HTP, give it a shot. You want to test several different um, sizes, of course. Now there is another kind of wick from Atkins and Pierce that's just simply called a square braid wick, and uh, it's not very commonly sold uh, by a lot of your your popular suppliers, candle maker suppliers, but you they do offer one that's just called square braid wick or square wick. And this is 
really the only one of the only types that we're going to mention today that fall into that square braid category because again they just haven't become as popular square braid wicks are used still a lot in beeswax candles so the next company that we're going to talk about is a manufacturer called Wedo. now it's w-e-d-o it's another one that you're going to be very probably pretty familiar with as they make a few very popular wicks as well first is being the lx wick and the lx wick is uh, again, a cotton wick, and, and what's interesting about the LX wick is that while it's still a flat braid wick, technically, it actually has a little bit more structure than the other flat braid wicks. And that's because it has some threads woven in to help stabilize it a little bit more. Now, again, HTP has some threads woven in, as all the other flat braid wicks do as well, but um, the LX wick does keep its structure a little bit more and it will give you a more symmetrical, kind of even centered burn pool. Because it gives one of those more consistent centered burn pools, it has become a pretty popular choice among the flat braid wicks. Um, it doesn't curl like your HTPs and your CDs, your Ecos would. Um, it, I mean, it can, but it's just not as common. It really does kind of keep that more centered stock, and it is a high stock wick, which has its pros and cons. Again, the con or the pro of this wick is that it stays nice and taut and centered. But one of the cons is uh, as it continues to burn, the stock, because it doesn't curl, it also doesn't really want to erode, but the stock will get taller and taller and taller. And so it might not look like to a customer that needs trimmed because it's not curling, you're not seeing a lot of debris, but it gets so tall that the flame can get really high. And that high stock um, is a characteristic of the LX wick. Um, it's really best for paraffin waxes and parasoy waxes. It's not as common and probably not recommended for soy as it's not a very robust flame that can help with, um, that is successful in those viscous waxes. Next is Eco. Uh, the Eco wick is a pretty common and popular wick these days as well, um, mostly because it's marketed pretty well by some of the main suppliers. It's another cordless a uh, flat braided wick that does have some paper filaments woven in. Again, it's to provide a little bit of structure. I would say the Eco has a little bit more structure than the HTP wick or the CD wick does, but I have found that it really is best in your uh, soy waxes. Now I've seen that it's marketed and made to be a good wick for low point paraffin waxes or low melt point paraffin waxes. I have not seen that in my experience. Um, I have tried Eco Wicks in every wax um, that I have sampled and I've really not had much luck with Eco overall. Um, the best wicks or the best wax that I've found that Eco has worked in has been uh, like a like a uh, all soy wax like a 464. Um, I've had luck with it in a parasoy of Claris 3022 which is mostly soy. And then what I really had the best success with it was the uh, old wax, the CB Advanced Soy Wax that um, was made by Eco Soya. It is no longer available. They no longer make that wax as of a few years ago. But other than that, I haven't had much luck with Eco wa uh, Wicks overall. Some suppliers still recommend it. Um, and I think that's mostly because they supply it. Uh, I don't find it to be the wick of choice in almost most of the applications I use. The last wick we're gonna talk about from Weedo is an RRD wick. This is a well-known wick to longtime seasoned candle makers. It's been around a long, long time, but is not very popular in use today. And it is a directional rounded wick. It's really kind of a mix between an LX and a cotton core wick, sort of. So it's a flat braid wick like an LX, but it really has more of a rounded shape like a cotton core. Um, but it is directional as well, which means that the capillary action, the flow of the fuel is really better in one direction. Oh geez, can't believe I just said that band. Flow is better in one direction to the flame. So you know how many of us when we're doing wick testing will trim the wick um, or, and then we'll reuse a wick later. So maybe we'll cut the wick um, off the tab and then we'll insert it into a, a candle to test a little bit further. And typically it doesn't matter which direction you put the wick in, bi-directional wicks. RRD wicks are a directional wick. Now it will flow both directions, but you really want to get the right end in the wax. Um, they're made to, to really flow fuel up one way uh, for the best capillary action. So if you do use RRD wicks, make sure you know that that is something that is unique to them. Um, again, this is a wick that is better for some of those tougher to burn viscous waxes. The last manufacturer that we're going to talk about today is the Heinz Jensen Technical Braided Wicks. Now, 
Um, Heinz Wicks is what you most mostly hear them refer to. Um, they make the CD wick and the CDN wick. The difference between a CD wick and a CDN wick is only that the CDN has a special chemical treatment that's been applied to it. The purpose of that treatment is to protect against some of the corrosive qualities of certain waxes, like soy can be a corrosive wax and some of the parasoys can be pretty corrosive as well. And it can kind of eat away at the wicks a little bit different. It, it can make the wicks inconsistent. Um, so if you've ever had inconsistent burn issues with soy waxes before, um, it's not uncommon. And this is one of the reasons that a CDN wick was created. Now, I believe that the CDN wick, that, that special chemical treatment that's been applied to it is patent pending. Most people aren't using a CDN wick. It's not super common. CD wicks are still by far the most popular. And if you ask most candle makers that have used both, they don't see much of a difference, me included. I'm not a big user of CD wicks in general. I'm not a big fan. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more later. But uh, between the two, I don't find much of a difference. Anyways, the CD and the CDN wick, um, they're also, by the way, referred to as Stabilo wicks or Stabilo wicks and Stabilo KST. The Stabilo is the CD wick. And actually, Stabilo is the current name. CD is the old name. Um, and then Stabilo KST is the CD in wick. It's that KST treatment that's been applied um, that makes it different from the original. Uh, but anyways, those are the, that's the only wicks we're going to talk about from the Heinz Jensen uh, group. That's the, that's the wick that is most commonly used by that company. There is one other wick type that I want to mention, um, and I'm not entirely sure what manufacturer makes it, uh, but I think it's worth mentioning because it's a pretty good overall wick, and it's becoming more and more popular. I see it in the, group, in the forums. I mention it a lot myself because I have found that it works in various applications, um, and that is the Premier 700 series wick. Uh, you can find it at Flaming Candle Company. I believe you can find it elsewhere as well. I'm not sure. It's the only place I bought it from. But it is essentially a hybrid flat braid wick and a cotton core wick. It's similar to LX in shape and appearance, but it has a cotton core to it. Out of all the traditional non-cord wicks, I would say it's the most rigid for sure. Uh, it's similar to LX, but I actually find it to be a better overall wick than LX wick. Some of the reasons are that it has a consistent burn properties. It has less smoke and soot. Um, and less mushrooming than a lot of the other wicks. Part of that is because it does stay upright a little bit more in the burn pool, especially for a flat braid type of wick. And that can really help keep the soot off the walls of the candles. And that's regardless if it's soy, coconut, or paraffin. Any of them can soot. I tend to find a little bit less with Premier's than I would something like the CD, the Eco, or even the HTP. I find that the Premier 700 is a really overall well-balanced wick, just like the HTP is, as it works in many various types of waxes. Um, I use several waxes in my company. I use uh, paraffin waxes, modeling paraffin waxes. I use three different parasoy blends and then I have and then I use the soy wax as well. And all of them I can use Premier wicks. Um, now I use various sizes and that is actually one of the other benefits of a Premier 700 wick is the Premier 700 series comes in several different sizes. The most of any of the wicks I've used. Um, they start all the way um, at 720, a Premier 725, all the way up to a Premier 799 is the highest that I've seen that I've used. And they're pretty much increments of five all the way up. So you get 725s. Um, and then actually, I think I use 735, 45, uh, 50, 60s, 70, 75. It's, it's not exactly five increments all the way through, but as you can see, there are several different sizes possible. And that helps you really dial in the right size a lot. So Premier 700 wicks, if you haven't used them before, check them out. Um, I will put a link in the description below, uh, but you can find them at the Flaming Candle Company. And again, if you haven't tried them out, you might find them beneficial. I would, I would give it a go. So let's talk about my favorites. Now I say that kind of tongue in cheek because I talked earlier in this video about you can't really have a favorite type of wick because it depends on all the variables, right? So I don't want you to think, wait a minute, he said he's, uh, he, there is no one size fits all wick. How could he have a favorite? That makes no sense. Okay, so before you chastise me, hear me out. Yes, 100% true. And I do not take back anything I said earlier. In fact, if it's the one thing you take away from this entire video, it's that every variable matters and you have to test every single change for the proper wick. Don't pick one wick and just run with it and hope for the best. There is no one size fits all wick. But that being said, 
if I am pressed to provide some recommendations or starting points for certain types of Wix, I've got a list for you that might help. Now I'm going to break this up into a few different chunks, and those chunks are the type of waxes. Now again, disclaimer, all these are recommendations as starting points for the type of wicks that I have found the most successful or most reliable in certain types of waxes. But again, the fragrance oil matters so much. The type of fragrance oil you're using and the amount of fragrance oil you're using. Usually the amount of oil you're using isn't going to change the wick type you're using, but it will definitely or could definitely change the size of the wick you're using. However, the type of oil that you're using could definitely change the wick type you're using. For example, in some of my candles, I have the exact same jar and the exact same wax, but I might use three different wick types in that jar with the same wax. Not just different sizes, three different wick types, and it's all because of the fragrance oil. So most of the oils kind of fall in this range of, um, they can all work with a certain type of wick with that same wax and jar, and they might fluctuate in size a little bit because one's a little heavier, one's a little lighter, something like that. Some oils have such different, drastically different properties that they just, they just change the formula so much of the wax, the overall wax blend, that a certain wick type just isn't optimal. It's not that it wouldn't work. And let me, let me I guess, clarify that real quick. When I'm saying that you might use different wick types and different sizes, it's not that you can't find several that will work, right? But we didn't get in this business to try to make just average candles, right? The whole purpose of a candle business, the whole purpose of being in business is you want to stand out. You want to earn customers and keep customers. You want people to want your candles. You don't want to just be another candle maker, right? Anyone can be, can be a candle maker. You can run to any hobby store. You can buy generic materials. You can throw something together and say you made a candle. But I'm assuming that you really care and you want to make the best candle possible, which means you want the most optimally burning wick possible because that is going to lengthen the life of your candle. It's also going to give the best performance overall. So backtrack now. You can find multiple wicks to work with multiple applications. I can make a candle and find four or five different wicks that will work, wick types that will work. My goal is to find the one that works the best. So that is what I'm talking about when I say test for every variable change, because what might be the perfect wick for this candle might be a different wick type or different size for this candle. And I have found that a lot. I have found certain oils that I use a lot that no matter what size I choose, certain wick types just flat out won't work. It just drowns or eats away the wick so fast that it always, it looks fine starting out and halfway down the jar, it just burns out um, and, and drowns out and there's nothing I can do about it. And so there are other wick types though that can handle that a little bit better. So again, I don't wanna to get too far and down to that. I could talk for ages on this, so I need to stay focused, stay focused. We'll have other videos on wick testing and how to, uh, and how to go about making the candle start to finish. This is just about wicks, just about wick types. Okay, so. That was exhaustive. Now, back to what I was trying to say, which is my general recommendations based off of wax types, what wicks I think I would start with. That's the best way to say it. Okay, starting with paraffin. With a typical paraffin wax, so let's say something like your 4630 or your 4627 waxes, those are common IGI waxes, uh, paraffin waxes, um, and even your modeling paraffin waxes, I would start with LX wicks, Premier 700 wicks, Zinc Core wicks, or HDP wicks. Those are the four that I find to be the most successful. Now I know you're like, oh, hey, that wasn't very helpful. You just threw out four different wick types for me. I thought you were gonna make it easy and give me one. Unfortunately, it's, fortunately I can't. It's just not, it's just not that easy. Um, those are the four wick types I'd start with, and I'd start with a few sizes of each, just depending on the size of your jar. The next is uh, all soy candle. So first we did all paraffin wax, this is all soy waxes. And here I got four more for you as well. Again, I would say it's Premier 700 wicks. I would also do CD wicks, Eco wicks, and HTP wicks. And you're gonna see Premier 700 and HTP mentioned several times because again, as I've talked about earlier, they're pretty universal wicks. But um, soy waxes is where I'll also start throwing in CD and Eco. The reason is, if you remember in the, in the descriptions of those wick types before, they both have more robust flames, even for flat braid wicks, and they're better for more viscous type waxes. Again, the CD wicks can tend to start waving on you and leaning over and causing non-symmetrical burn pools 
and you'll start, they'll start clubbing real bad on the top. Um, I find CD wicks do it even worse than eco wicks do. And so they're still not my favorite type of wicks, but this is the wax application where I would use them. Now, I should also say real quick, I know a lot of people are ultra fanatic about CD wicks. You'll see a lot of suppliers even say that like CD wicks are the best. They're the favorite among candle makers. I see that a lot, and um, but if you talk to actual candle makers, you won't hear that as much as you see it written. And I don't know why that is. Um, I, I understand the properties of the CD wicks could make it a favorite just because you can use it in pretty much everything, like an HTP wick or Premier wick, and it can handle the tough to burn wax, waxes. And which so because of that, you can use it across the board. But I never find it to be the most optimal one. It's almost like if you if you were to could pick one wick the rest of your life, just have to somehow make it work. Sure, it'd be a great choice. But because we don't have to do that, and we've got hundreds to choose from, it's very rarely the one that I choose specifically. Does that make sense? So I went off a little bit of a tangent there. So let, let's get back to the, my favorites. Um, the next would be your parasoys. And on the parasoys, I still recommend HTP, Premier 700s, and Zincs. Now, again, the zinc is going to depend on the level of soy that's in the parasoy. If it's heavier on soy, zinc maybe not as much. If it's heavier on the paraffin side, then zinc's a good one. But uh, yeah, zinc, Premier, and HTP. Um, and then again, occasionally soy or a CD and Eco. The last wax we're going to talk about is coconut or coconut paraffin blend. The two wicks that I find best in these uh, is a little simpler for me. And again, it's just HTP and Premier. Now, it's a low melt point. So it's going to use a smaller wick than you're traditionally used to. And so when I say HTP and Premier, make sure you're adjusting accordingly for the wick size. I do find that Premier's and HTP's do work well in coconut, but you've got to, you've really got to use the smaller sizes um, and then work your way up from there. Okay, so that's a dive into the specific wicks types, uh, what makes them unique from each other, where they can be most purposeful in their applications and when you should consider using them. But there's one other thing that I wanna mention real quick. And I know this isn't a candle making video. This is more of an informational video about wicks in general, but I, I feel odd. I feel a little weird talking about wicks and then not mentioning uh, wick tabs or the way to adhere your wicks to the jars. So let me just throw this little nugget in real quick. You have a few different options when you're going to use you have a few different options when you're going to attach your wicks to the jars. The first option is not to, and that's a bad option. Let's just be honest. Uh, I've, I've seen way too many videos and DIY posts and blogs about some hand crafter on Pinterest talking about how you can make your own candles at home. And they literally just take a bowl and they take a wick and they just set it in the center or maybe they'll put a little wax on or something and set it in the center and then they pour the candle on top and they just think that's going to work um, and then a couple burns in the wicks moving and floating all over the place i am assuming that none of you are doing that if you are i would highly recommend stopping the next option is i just touched on it and that is slightly better than not doing it at all and that is using a high melt point wax on the bottom of your wick tab and then securing that to your jar and then pouring your can the rest of your candle in. Um, I say slightly better because at least you used something. I realistically though, I don't think it's any better at all. I mean, the concept to me of using wax as a glue to hold your wick is almost hilarious to me because the rest of your candle is also made out of wax and the whole purpose of that wax is to melt. I know that it's typically gonna be a higher melt point wax on the bottom of your wick, but the wax is gonna soften up and that wick is just not gonna stay there. I think we all know that. So let's get to the real options. Uh, the first real option, the most common by far, is your wick stickers. Now, it does depend where you get them. You wanna get high quality ones. I would buy them from your reputable suppliers. I have never had any that were cheap and would just come unstuck, but I have seen complaints of it. Uh, I would just make sure that when you're buying them, you're looking for high temp resistant or very good adhesion. Um, I've typically bought mine from places like Candle Science, uh, and I've, I've bought them from a few different places. I've never had an issue with them coming loose, although I know it happens and I've heard others have it happen as well. 
My advice, if you're experiencing wick stickers coming loose in your jar, before assuming that the stickers are just not good or not a good option, is to make sure your jars are clean. The wick stickers aren't going to stick very well if there's dust, debris, anything. Um, you know, do a little spritz of rubbing alcohol. Make sure they're clean. Wash them out before you use them. You should be probably doing that anyways, but uh, that will help the wick sticker adhere to it. Also, make sure you're actually pressing down and securing that wick sticker to the jar firmly. If you just kind of set it in there and then immediately pour in your liquid, yeah, it's, it's not going to stay put. Um, but if you get it, if you get it down in there and you really press it in nice and firm and maybe give it, you know, a couple minutes, just kind of get that tacky, uh, touch to it, then you should be fine. Um, the other thing that can cause wick stickers to come loose is if you're pouring your wax super hot. So the only time I don't use wick stickers or would consider not using wick stickers is if I'm making a modeling wax, uh, a modeling paraffin candle, or like a palm candle, because those are poured at such high temperatures. You can pour those anywhere between 185 and 200 degrees. That, that could be enough to maybe make those wick stickers loosen up a little bit. Um, but again, I've still never really had that happen. I still think wick stickers are a good choice. Most candle makers are using them. I would say um, the majority at least are using them. So I would still think they're a good choice. The next is hot glue. Now, hot glue comes in several varieties as well. As long as you're using a high temp uh, hot glue, then you should be totally fine. I don't use hot glue myself, so I would just recommend reaching out or asking others to use hot glue, what works for them, what hot glue they're buying, um, and just, uh, just make sure that you do some testing first. Last but not least is a RTV silicone adhesive. Um, Jeff Stanley talks a lot about this. Uh, I know he uses it quite a bit and it is a uh, red RTV. It is cheap, it only costs a few bucks. And it is a silicone, silicone based type of adhesive. Works great. Uh, your wicks definitely aren't going anywhere, that's for sure. Um, it can ex withstand temperatures of like, I think 600 degrees or higher. So it's, uh, and it's also gonna re resist multiple types of liquid. So wax is no issue for it. Melted wax is no issue for it at all. It's, it was really made for uh, gaskets in the auto industry. So you can understand that it's going to work. Your wicks definitely aren't moving. Um, however, that's also kind of one of the drawbacks about it. If you do plan to reuse your jars, either for additional testing or once a customer is done with it, maybe they wanna use it for storage or you know to put little decorative items in it or whatever, I mean, Good luck getting that out. You're usually going to break the glass before that sucker will come up. So uh, just one thing to consider. Uh, I, don't, I don't think for most people that's a huge issue. Um, the bigger issue for me with the RTV is the time it takes to cure. To me, it's a little bit kind of an, uh, a, a workflow process issue for me to try to use RTV because uh, the cure time is about 24 hours or more, depending on the environment that you're in. So you would have to apply the RTV and the wicks and then if you try to pour your candles any sooner before the cure time, it's really not that effective or effective at all, potentially. So um, again, uh, Jeff Stanley does use this a lot. So if you have any questions or um, concerns about it, he might be able to give you better information on it than me. I have used it. Um, and again, it does work well, but um, I just generally don't have the situation where I can wick a bunch of candles and then wait a day to pour them. Um, it just, to, to me, becomes a logistical issue at that point, if that makes sense. Okay, so we covered a lot of information today, um, really all about Wix, just, just as the title said. Um, hopefully you found some value in it. Um, I know that wicking's a pain. We, we all know that. It is the bane of every candle maker's existence, right? But it is so critically important to get right. If I had to estimate, if I had to make an educated guess, I would say that 80% or more of the struggles and problems and mistakes that candle makers have is regarding wicking um, or at least related to wicks in some way. And so it, it's extremely important to get it right. A proper or improper wick is often the difference between a successful candle and a non-successful candle. You know, the difference between a candle that people really enjoy and come back for or a candle that's just like some cheapo that they would never recommend or even worse, they might poorly rate or return, right? And it can also be the difference between a successful candle business and one that fails. So leave a comment below about one of your favorite wick wax type combinations that you use a lot. And uh, maybe you can offer some advice to others that might be having struggles with a, an application that you use.
Well, good luck to everyone. Thanks for stopping by and watching this video. Hopefully you learned a few things and found it helpful. I appreciate you subscribing, liking the video, hitting that little bell notification because I do have several other videos coming down the road and hopefully sooner than later. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Happy candle making. Thanks.